We are in the book of Revelation. You might like to turn there with me to Revelation chapter 1. I'm excited about the knowledge that uh, as John is writing, remember from last time that the whole book of Revelation is the revelation of Jesus Christ. He wanted to reveal Christ to us and that's what it's all about. And, and as I started looking at it, I did 1 to 3 last time and I've only got to verse 8 this time because there's so much that John is revealing of Christ even in his introduction. And I could skip over it and uh, say, let's get to the good parts, but this is the good part. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ. This is Jesus Christ being revealed to us. And uh, John does it in, in all the verses. In fact, in this book, I would say that there's more descriptions of Christ than anywhere else in the, in the, in the whole of the scriptures. And so it's going to feel like a bit of a Bible study. We're going to touch a lot of doctrines because they're there. We're going to go back to the Old Testament. We're going to look at the Gospels. When Jesus Christ was on this earth, he said a lot of things about uh, his death, burial, and resurrection and end times. Uh, the book of Zechariah, the book of Jeremiah, the book of Daniel all speaks about that. So we'll be touching on that, as I said last time, as we go through this book. Because Revelation is the bookend. It, it is the future. And everything that has gone before it and all the books of, this, uh, of the Bible build up to what we're looking at, the revelation of Jesus Christ. And so we have to go back into other scriptures. We have to look at that, and that's what we'll be doing this morning. And so I hope it doesn't feel like too much of a Bible study for you, but uh, we have to go back into the Old Testament to make sense of the book of Revelation. Now you might remember last time I was up here, I mentioned the fact that Revelation is the only book where we have this promise in the beginning of it in verse 3. You might like to refresh your memories and just read verse 3 or look at it as I read. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those, those things which are written in it for the time is near. And so we looked at a little bit of that last week and we... The fact is we're always blessed when, whenever we study God's word, we know that. But this is the only book where we have a promise from God of the specific blessing of people who not only read it, not only hear it, but obey it. And so as we go through this book together, we're in for a special blessing. We also have a blessing in chapter 22. You might like to turn there with me to chapter 22, verse 7. Because the, the blessings don't stop all the way through. Revelation 22, 7 says, And behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who heeds the words of the prophecy of this book. So if you're heeding these, if you're doing the words, not only listening, as James would say, you don't want to be just a hearer of the word, you want to be a doer of the word. And so there's good times ahead, ladies and gentlemen, as we go into the book of Revelation. It's exciting. <laughs> But what I didn't mention last time together, and I want to bring up this morning, is that there are warnings in, the, in this book as well. And just a few verses on from verse 7 that we just read in chapter 22, we come to verse 18 of chapter 22. And it says, I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues which are written in this book. Very solemn. It's a very dangerous practice to add to the words of the book of Revelation. My advice to you, take these words, this prophecy, just as they are. Don't add to them. God's promise has always happened. For those who, well, actually, I think we're the only home group going, still going through Kings, but last week, we, God promised something and then we see it happening. And I, don't, I think we stand on the promises of God all the time. And we know that God's promise will come true, don't we? We know that. He cannot but do it. And he says here that if anyone adds to these words, God will add to him the plagues. And then in verse 19 of that same chapter, And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his part, from the tree of life and from the holy city which are written in this book. 
This is a solemn promise from God. Don't add, don't take away. So who is John talking to here? Who should take heed of what we've just written? Well, almost immediately we all would say, well, obviously it's the unsaved. They take great joy in taking away from this prophecy. They have great joy in spiritualizing this prophecy. They have great joy in adding to it. After all, those who deliberately do, uh, do that despise the word of God, indicating that they are unsaved. It's very much what Benji said. You are drawn to the word of God because it is God's word to us. And as believers, we're drawn to it. We don't want to add to it. God will add to the unsaved the plagues which are written in this book. And the unsaved will have no part in the tree of life and the holy city which are written in this book. But isn't that true of all unsaved? Now I'm going to be blunt here. If you sit here this morning and you've never accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Saviour, let me tell you, whether or not you add or take away from this book or this prophecy and revelation, your name is still not written in the Lamb's Book of Life and you will definitely have no part of the Tree of Life and the Holy City. And what's even worse, if that's possible, if the Lord were to come today at this very minute to take his church to be with him, those who are not born again will suffer the plagues which are written in this book. It's a promise. It's going to happen. <coughs> but who is John writing to? Last week we spent some time to, to look at the fact that he's writing to his bondservants. He's writing to the Lord's bondservants, to Christian churches. I testify to everyone who hears the words of this prophecy of the book. He's testifying to everyone who hears and reads it. John's warning <coughs> addresses the hearer, the believer in the congregation where this book was read aloud. And by analogy, it would apply to anyone reading or studying this book today. And so does that mean that as Christians... If we tamper with God's prophecy and revelation that we'll be brought back to this earth to suffer the plagues of the tribulation or that we will lose our salvation and have no part of the tree of life and the holy city, is that, is that what it's saying? Oh, Karen, Karen's got a strange look on her face. You're hoping I'm going to say something. May God forbid. May it never be. I'll give you a resounding no because the Bible clearly teaches throughout its entirety that once you are saved, you are always saved. Amen? Amen. Turn with me to John chapter 10. <coughs> I just want to bring some scripture into it so you can have a look. John chapter 10 verse 27. To me, this is the apex of the doctrine of once saved, always saved. John 10 27. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. <coughs> and I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Amen. What wonderful words to let us know that we, once we're saved, we're always saved. But still, John's warning is addressed to the believer in the congregation who was, the book was being read aloud. So what does verses 18 and 19 mean for us as believers? Why did John put them in there? <coughs> you know, I don't know. I really don't. The scriptures teach me it's, you can't lose your salvation. I will, no one can snatch us out of the Lord's hands. But I do know that other scriptures do say it. Proverbs 36 says, do not add to his words or he will reprove you and prove you a liar. That's Proverbs 30 verse 6. Do not add to his words or he will reprove you. Does anyone here want to be reproved of the Lord? Uh, I certainly don't. And he will prove you to be a liar. 
Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 2. You shall not add to the word which I am commanding you, or take away from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. The Lord is commanding us not to take or add to the word. And so I simply am unable to explain the penalties given in these two verses for us as Christians. But I, I want to leave you with one thing, and that is it's a dangerous thing to tamper with the prophecy of God. Proverbs says you could be reproved. You certainly will be uh, proved a liar. And Deuteronomy says that you need to keep the commandments of God. Do not add or take away. And so the one who guards the word, the one who obeys it will be blessed. But if you alter it, if you add to it, if you try to spiritualize it away in this prophecy, (coughs) if you say, well, I'll take this part, but I'm not going to take that part, you will be disciplined in some way. It's a solemn warning against ignoring, perverting, or tampering with the message of this book. And so we come this morning with these thoughts in mind. I hope we always come to the book of Revelation with these thoughts in mind. We are to do no tampering. Just take the word as it is. And if we do that, we will and ask the Holy Spirit to to be with us and to show us his word because he leads us into all truth. Don't leave him out. Ask him to help you to to take on the word and to understand it because it's God's word. And so after having a blessing and now showing you some warnings, let's go into chapter, chapter 1, verse 4. John's greeting to the seven churches he's writing to. Let me read it to you. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood. And he has made us to be a kingdom, priest to his God and Father, to him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him, so it is to be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. John was an older man by the time he wrote this letter to the seven churches of Asia Minor, possibly in his late 80s, early 90s. Domitian had put him into exile in the Isle of Patmos for preaching the gospel. In fact, if we just read verse 9 of chapter 1, that is explained to us. I, John, your brother and fellow partaker in the tribulation and kingdom and perseverance which are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. So he was there for preaching the gospel for doing what uh, we would do normally in a day when you share the gospel with someone. And while he was in exile on the island of Patmos, John received this vision, this prophecy from the Lord. I'm not going to go back over how he received it, that we did that last time. The recipients are the seven churches from Asia Minor, or at least seven of them. There were many others, but (coughs) the churches we're going to look at in future is Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamon, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Seven first churches in Asia Minor. Now we'll see them in chapters 2 and 3, so I'm not going to, uh, to look at the churches today. I'm not going to talk about them except to let you know that they are literal con- congregations meeting in those towns as Christians. They're not periods of times, they're not uh, nuances of how Christianity has gone through the ages. They are churches. And John is writing a letter to them. But let's look at that next time. What about our greeting here? A greeting that's full 
of explanations of who Christ is. First of all, I want you to notice, or I hope you did notice, that John's greeting of grace is from the Trinity. From him who is and who was and who is to come, who is the Father. From the seven spirits who are before his throne, from the Holy Spirit. Hold on. What in the world is he talking about there? Are there seven Holy Spirits? I'd never realized that. No, there's not. So as we go through this book, we're going to see the relevance of numbers particularly as they relate to the Jews. To the Jews, every number represented something from God. For instance, 40 is the number that represents testing. And so it's no coincidence that it rained for 40 days and 40 nights. It's no coincidence that Moses was on the backside of the desert for 40 years. It's no coincidence that the Jews wandered for 40 years. It's no coincidence that Jesus, when he was in the wilderness, was there for what? 40 days and 40 nights. It's a number, a time of testing. (coughs) We'll see in Revelation 13 that 666 is the number of man. Whereas 7 stands for perfection. We're going to see seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bowls. All God's perfect uh, perfect judgment upon this earth. And here we read from the seven spirits who are before his throne, seven representing perfection. Not the fact that there are seven holy spirits, but also it could mean the seven ministries, sevenfold ministry of the spirit. If you'd like to turn with me to Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1. As I said, we're going to be going backwards and forwards a little bit, but we have to explain these things as they come up. So from the seven spirits are before his throne, we see that his perfectness. But also in Isaiah 11, we talk about the sevenfold ministry of the Spirit of God. Isaiah 11, verse 1. There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of its roots. And we know that to be David, and then on to Jesus Christ. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge, and the spirit of the fear of the Lord. The sevenfold ministry of the Holy Spirit is what I believe is referring to. So we have God the Father who is and was and who is to come, the Holy Spirit perfect in his ministry. And of course we read in verse 5, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler over the kings of the earth. Now, we can just skip over that. But John is describing the person of Jesus Christ. He's he's describing the power of Jesus Christ. And um, and he's also describing the priority of Jesus Christ. Let's look at the faithful witness. In his person, he faithfully witnessed to the people as when he was on this earth. He faithfully preached to the priests of Israel. He faithfully preached even to Pilate during his life and ministry here on this earth. He was faithful in all he did. Some witnesses are not faithful, but Jesus Christ is and and, uh, was faithful. Secondly, his position. What's the position of Jesus Christ? It says there he is the firstborn from the dead. Now I want to take a little time on this because... When I first read that, I thought of 1 Corinthians, that pastor has taught us in the past. 1 Corinthians 15.20 says, But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the firstfruits of those who have fallen asleep. And so we, we can see that Jesus Christ was the first one to be resurrected from the dead. But only the first, because we're going to follow him. And while that's very true, and that's what Corinthians is talking about, In Revelation chapter 1 verse 7, firstborn does not mean the first one raised from the dead. What it means is the highest of those raised from the dead. And we can see that if you'd like to turn to one verse in Colossians 1.18. And it's important that we see this because he is the firstborn, but the firstborn is a title of honour. 
Colossians 1.18 says, He is also head of the church, a head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. He has priority. That is his position. He is above all, and we'll see in his power, which is the next one, he is ruler of all. And that's what it says in the next section. Christ is the ruler over, ruler over the kings of the earth. And dare I say, even Donald Trump. He is the prince of the kings of the earth. When he comes back in chapter 19, verse 16, he is going to be called, or he is called now, but he's going to be written on him, King of kings and Lord of lords. He is the King of kings. He is the Lord of lords. He is the ruler over all the kings of the earth. And I hope you understand and believe that. His position is he is first and his power, he is king of kings. And even in his introduction, John can't help but break out into the doxology of praise about him. But he doesn't stop there. Because he keeps going and, and, he's, and he dedicates his letter to Christ. As I said last time, Revelation is not given to us to reveal the future. It's given to us to reveal Jesus Christ. Because all we need to know about our future is that Christ is in control and he's coming back. That's all we need to know. And so because of his purpose to reveal Jesus Christ to us, Revelation has more designations, more descriptions of the Lord than any other book. And it starts here in verse 5. To him who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood. That's who Jesus Christ is. He's the one who came seeking us to find us and to love us. Some time ago, Campus Crusaders for Christ came out with a theme called, I found it. And so billboards had the word, I found it. Bumper stickers said, I found it. People on TV were saying, hello, my name is so-and-so and I found it. It was a kind of a hook to get people curious. And then they talk about how they found Jesus Christ. And while I don't have a problem with that per se, the truth is, we didn't find him. He found us. You see, religion, all religion, is man searching for God. And I don't, I don't have a lot of time for religion. But Christianity, on the other hand, is God searching for man. Jesus himself said in Luke 19, verse 10, For the Son of Man has come to, what? Seek and save that which was lost. We don't go looking for God. Romans tells us no one seeks after God. No one. God sent his Son seeking out those to save those who are lost, and that's the glorious truth. Jesus found us with his love. And there's another thing here at the end of verse 5. John says about Jesus as he dedicates this prophecy to him. And that is Jesus frees us with his blood. That's what we've been looking at and singing about. And I doubt for a minute maybe that um, Benji knew exactly what I was going to say, but the God did. Benji picks these songs and we talk about salvation and think about it at the cross, at the cross. This is what it, Jesus freed us with his blood. He washed us from our sins in his own blood. And you can picture that. A piece of cloth, dirty and filthy. The scriptures say that our righteousness is just filthy rags or just as filthy rags. We have no righteousness of our own. I think someone said, and I'm sorry I forgot who it is, that when God sees us, he doesn't see our righteousness. He sees the righteousness of Christ. The blood covering us, washed us clean. <laughs> and when you put an ordinary piece of cloth that's, that's dirty and filthy in, a, in water and you wash it, what happens? Well, if you've got good laundry detergent, all the dirt and grime is gone. That's simply what it's talking about. Jesus Christ washed us in his blood and we are 
white as snow. Better than Sard's wonder soap. His blood shed for us on the cross and it's his blood that frees us from our sin. So Jesus Christ finds us with his love. He seeks out those who he needs to save and that which are lost. And then he frees us with his blood. But then he goes on to fashion us for his service. And that's what the rest of verse 6 says. And he has made us to be kingdom, <coughs> to be a kingdom, priest to his God and Father. We sometimes stay away from that word priest because of Catholicism and all that that means. But the reality is I am a priest. The reality is you are all priests. That's what the scripture te teaches us. It's uh, the doctrine of the priesthood of believers. One of the most important doctrines we hold as ev evangelical Christians. What does it mean? Well, it simply means there is no other Christian more highly elevated spiritually than you are. You don't have to go through a, a person, a mediator to get to God. You don't have to go through anyone you don't have to pray through anyone, whether it be saints or Mary or anyone else. You pray to God through the Lord Jesus Christ, who is our high priest. And so in those, in those simple verses, we have the fact that he, he sought us out. He, he loved us. He cleansed us from our sins. And not only that, we just don't sit on our backsides. He now made us a, a kingdom and we are priests. And then it says, and what else can you say? To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. What a wonderful doxology. And we're only in the introduction. But John couldn't stop still. See, when you say amen, you're supposed to stop. But John goes on in verses 7 to 8 to continue to reveal Jesus Christ. He's excited. And he says, behold, he is coming with clouds and every eye will see him. <coughs> Let me say, the king is coming. I don't want us to misunderstand this verse, by the way. When Jesus Christ comes back to rapture the church, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 says he's coming in the clouds. Let's read that together. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 to 17. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And this will fulfill the first part of verse 7 back in Revelation. Behold, he is coming with clouds. This is what Thessalonians 4 verse 16 says. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. That's the rapture. I believe the scripture teaches it could happen at any moment. There's not a single thing on the calendar, on the biblical calendar, that has to be fulfilled for that to happen. But understand that Revelation 1-7 is not talking about the rapture. It's talking about the Lord's coming when he, every eye will see him. See, at the rapture, every eye is not going to see the Lord. The Lord, we are meeting him in the air, in the clouds. Every eye won't see him. And I'm sure a lot of you have seen uh, or heard of stories or books there where the people just disappear. And I believe that's what it will be. And our clothes will be just there, will be gone. Every eye won't see him. So what is chapter 1 verse uh, 7 in Revelation term, talking about? Well, turn with me to Matthew 24. Again, his ministry on this earth, he was a faithful witness and we're going to read some. Matthew 24 verse 29. Matthew 24 verse 29 says, Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. We'll see that in, in chapters 6, 7, 8 and onwards of Revelation. 
verse 30, Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. I don't want you to be confused about the second coming. There are passages that say that when Jesus comes back, that he'll come as a thief in the night that no one will see him. He'll come suddenly, silently, secretly, and then we'll be all gone. And there are other passages that talk about him coming in power and majesty and glory and every eye is going to see him when he's, his feet are plant, planted on the Mount of Olives and it breaks in two. You can't help but see him. So which is it? Which coming is it? It can't be both, can it? That one coming, you can't not see him and see him at the same time. Well, it's not the same coming, they're different comings. Because when the Lord comes to rapture the church, it will be like a thief in the night. Suddenly, in the twinkling of an eye, you will be changed. But when he comes back, some seven years after, the, after or where we are now, will be, after the battle uh, after um, the tribulation, at what we term the Battle of Armageddon, every eye is going to see him. And we're going to see more of that in the future. And so there are two comings. The first one is to take his church to be with him. The second one is to come in power and might at the battle, after the battle, of, or at the Battle of Armageddon. We'll turn to... Um, Zechariah, in a minute, you might like to start turning there to Zechariah chapter 12, because it says in the end of verse 7, Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him. And then he adds, Even those who pierced him. What is that talking about? Who are they? Who are those who pierced him? Zechariah 12 is a prophecy about the battle of Armageddon that I just mentioned. As I said, the Old Testament has prophesied everything that's happened in the, in the book of Revelation. The nations are gathering at Megiddo uh, and they, they're looking to destroy Jerusalem towards the end of the tribulation. And Zechariah chapter 12 verse 1 says, The burden of the word of the Lord against Israel. <clears throat> Thus says the Lord, who stretches out the heavens, lays the foundation of the earth and forms the spirit of man within him. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness to all the surrounding peoples when they lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall happen in that day that I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all peoples. All who would heave it away will surely be cut to pieces, though all nations of the earth are gathered against it. In that day, says the Lord, I will strike every horse with confusion and its rider with madness. I will open my eyes on the house of Judah and I will strike every horse of the people with blindness. And I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on me whom they pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for his firstborn. Those who pierced him are the Jews. When the Lord returns at Armageddon, the Israelites will receive divine enablement to look on me whom they pierced. Referring to the nation's actions of rejecting the Messiah of piercing Christ, crucifying him. And so at the second return of Christ, when Christ comes with all power, Israel will finally recognize her Messiah and turn to him. Romans says all will be saved. When we get there, we will discover from Scripture, as described in Jeremiah 30, verse 7, that the tribulation is all about the Jewish nation. The scripture in Jeremiah 37 says and calls it the time of Jacob's trouble. Again, more about that when we get there. I'm just whetting your appetite because John has whetted our appetite 
by saying he will come in the clouds and all will see him. Suffice to say for right now, behold, verse 7, he is coming in the clouds and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him, so it is to be. Amen. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ. And then in verse 8, we have Jesus' own description of himself. Now, I don't know if you have Bibles. If you have a red letter Bible, these words are in red. So they must be Jesus' words. Otherwise, they wouldn't be in red. Is that right? It doesn't really matter. Don't get caught up on it because Jesus is God. (laughs) Okay? Don't separate the Trinity to the point where you don't even call Jesus God or the Holy Spirit God. This is God speaking, whether it be in the person of Jesus Christ or the person of the Father, doesn't matter. It's in red. It's in red in my Bible, so it must be Jesus. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God. Now, you're all Greek scholars, so I don't have to tell you that Alpha and Omega are the first and last letter of the Greek alphabet. Alpha, Beta, Gamma, Delta, then Omega is the last letter. So when he's saying I'm the Alpha and the Omega, he's simply saying I am the A to the Z. I am everything in between. I'm the first, I'm the last. I'm the beginning, I'm the end. I'm everything. There is nothing besides me. I am eternally existent and I'm all powerful. The Omega, the Alpha to the Omega. And then he says, who is and who was And who is to come? The Almighty. Jesus Christ is the present. Who is? He's the past. Who was? And he is the future. Who is to come? And the Greek word for Almighty means the all-powerful one. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God. Who is and who was and who is to come? When we get into chapter 4 and beyond... The actual scripture is going to say who is and who is to come. I'm not going to talk about the who was because it's going to get into who is to come. But we'll get there. I have been joking to people who want to listen that I think the Lord will come back before I finish it. But that's all right. It's not a problem. See, when God said to Moses at the burning bush, I am who I am. He was saying, I have always been. I'm right here now and I always will be. I am the powerful one. And Jesus Christ is saying the very same thing. And that's what we're going to see in the rest of the book. Jesus Christ is saying to us, I am the coming king. Get ready for me. I am the alpha and the omega. I'm everything you need. And I am the Almighty One. We've looked at a lot of doctrinal scripture this morning. Out of necessity, I don't think we can pass over the description of Christ that John has been given and just say, well, that sounds good. We're going to do that quite a bit because we have to. We have to compare scripture with scripture. We have to show that uh, the Old Testament prophesied of this. The Old Testament knew about this. Because God knew about it. 